to become a firefighter was never the vision. I was trying to do other things with my life, which involved violence and the things that come with the streets. I have some dark secrets. Hey everyone, welcome back to Rooting for Everybody Black, your visual index for all things black excellence. I'm your host, Ashley B. And today we're sitting down with Mount Vernon's very own, whom some would call a hood hero, to talk humble beginnings, fatherhood, plus more. Ladies and gentlemen, Francis Coleman. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being a guest. Right. So let's get started. Where are you from? I'm from Mount Vernon, but I was born in Queens. How old are you? 32. Okay, so if you could go back 20 years, what would you have thought life would be like now? <laughs> Dead or in jail. Dead or in jail? Dead or in jail. Why? So most people don't know, I'm from 34th Street, right around the corner from 3rd and 3rd. I have, like, people that's older than me, they know my older brother, Delta, rest in peace, Dwayne Powell. And um, back then, when I was growing up, Bloods and Crips was heavy, violence was heavy. If you know about 3rd and 3rd, it's just the way how you survive over there. So growing up, to become a firefighter was never the vision. I was trying to do other things with my life, which involved violence and the things that come with the streets. So I had a, a completely different path. Mm -hmm. And then over time, things changed. Mm -hmm. As with life. So you briefly mentioned your brother, Dwayne. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about him. Who was he to you? Mm -hmm. My brother, um, oof. All right, we're not going to cry on set here, but um, but um, yeah, my brother was my first hero. Speaking of heroes or inspiration, taught me how to tie my shoes, taught me how to fight, and as I was starting to have like a role model figure, his life was taken back in two thousand and one. Take me back to that day when you found out that he had passed. <sighs> Ooh, I don't care. Um, okay, so. He used to live a certain lifestyle. What lifestyle? He was in the streets. Okay. Um, and there was one day they had a deal. The deal didn't go well and he came home. Now he used to keep stuff at the house. Okay. Um, regular night, me and mom home. He comes home, he goes to where he usually keeps things. And as he's racing out, my mom stops him like, hey, can you pick me up a couple things? Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, mom, no problem. Be right back. I'm right there playing the video game, um, Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> yeah, I still remember that video game. And um, he said he would be right back. And later on that night, we got the call. And he didn't come home? Never came home. Emotions. I'm sure you felt a lot during that time. Funny thing is, at first, I felt... I didn't know what to feel. Mm -hmm. um, I went to school the next day, not knowing that this is on the news, everyone's talking about it. I didn't know he was popular. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the whole city known him. And next thing you know, I'm at school and I kind of knew something was going on and I'm in class and I think um, a social worker came to speak to me. Mm -hmm. um, I always remember her name, um, Mrs. Johnson Cooper mm -hmm. and then it's not until I'm in the office with her and she's asking me questions, making things a little bit uncomfortable. And then everything started to set in like, oh, my brother's gone. But at nine years old, you really don't fully understand mm -hmm. that you will never see your brother again. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay, hopefully something changes and I can see him again. And it's like, no. So. Okay, so that must have been a hard time for you growing up. Yeah. At first, you don't understand it, but as things start to kick in, there were benchmarks within my life where it started to really set in. So you mentioned he was your hero. How would you define the word hero and tell me why you claim him as your hero? Defining the word hero, I would say someone you feel like you can count on. Someone that when you don't know who to run to, They'll come to you or they'll come with the answers, the solutions, or even the advice. Like Superman. <laughs> yeah. 
I'll, I'll go with Batman. Batman. I like Batman better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he was your hero. Mm -hmm. You're a hood hero, if you will. <laughs> well, do you consider yourself a hero? Um, I really don't like to go with names. I, I like to just live my life. Let the people cast whatever names they have. Because mm -hmm. just with life in general, I realize that you just have to be you. If you get caught up into the names or the titles, there may be a day where they're not calling you that. And because they're not calling you, are you not that anymore? So therefore, I'd rather not call myself anything and just be me. So you don't think you're a hero? No. You're just regular? Just regular. I could, I could go on a tangent about this, but I feel like too many people get into egos. Mm -hmm. They get into their head, they start believing that I'm supposed to be this, I'm supposed to be that. And if ever there's a time that changes, do you still have that feeling to you? Mm -hmm. Like, so, is, that, or is that person still your hero, even though they're not doing what they used to do? Exactly. Gotcha. Or there's times, like, if I knew more information about you, now that title was taken just because mm. of this one thing. So I'd rather not get into titles, names, and just continue being Francis Coleman. Right. So did you ever tell your brother that he was your hero? Did he know this? I never got a chance to. Never got a chance to. Never got a chance to. And how do you feel about that? Well, knowing that in spirit he's around, I think I lived up to whatever he was hoping that I would live up to. I think I, and then me being the father that I am and him never being, getting a chance to be a father, even though he has a son. Mm -hmm. So when he passed, he had just had which is my nephew, Joshua, and he never really got the chance to be a father to him. So therefore, that's probably the reasons that, that's some of the reasons why I'm the way that I am with my kids and his. Right. So you mentioned um, your brother was like a father figure to you. Mm -hmm. Where was your father? Uh, Jamaica. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was back in Jamaica. My entire life. Got you. That's why you say that your brother basically raised you because your father wasn't present in America with you? Well, my mom was my father. If you want to say who was my father figure, that was my mom. My mom was mother, father, and anything else you could think of. She, she did everything that she could. My father just didn't like America, so he went to Jamaica. It was just that. He just liked being in Jamaica, so I didn't have my father in my life, even though we have a relationship now. Okay. Do you visit him often in Jamaica? Recently, I, I started visiting him. So, um... Why? Did, why? why now? So, it, so, when my brother died, when I was nine, the following year, my mom said, all right, I think you should meet your father. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I met my father when I was nine, and it was a culture shock. So, me being nine being under my mom, being spoiled, mm -hmm. life was a bliss. I go to him and I think I just finished third grade at the time. And in Jamaica, they learned their times tables a little bit earlier. Oh, so Me did. going there, at so you learn your times tables in America, fourth grade, you start learning times tables and division mm -hmm. in public schools, Catholic school is different than in public schools. So I go to him, he must have said something to me I didn't know the multiplication. And from that point, my vacation was over. Oh. So I was in a room learning my times tables and divisions, being quizzed at nine years old. Okay. And coming from America, it's like I'm supposed to be on a vacation. I'm supposed to be going fishing with my father and everything. And I got this dude disciplining me, yeah. learning times tables. So it was a horror film for me. And then I met him again. So I came back. Then my mother passed away when I was 17. Oh, yeah. My mother passed away when I was 17. So 18, when I graduated high school, I met him again. And at the time, he had his hardware store up and running now. So attached to his house, he had a full-blown hardware store in- In Jamaica. In Jamaica. So for people that know Jamaica, he lives, and above rocks and in above rocks there's no hardware store in the area so what he created is the only hardware store in above rocks like a monopoly so i'm living there 
constantly people are banging on the window. Yeah. Hey, hey. And they call my father conscious. So conscious, conscious. <laughs> they, they, I would hear it all day. And um, we didn't really get to bond because the whole time he was trying to run a store. Working. So that was another time where we didn't really have a bond. And then recently, once I had a daughter, um, I was like, you know what? Let me start at least giving him the opportunity to meet my daughter, even though we don't have a relationship like that. And then now we started shaking hands and having conversations because I'm a man and I understand where he comes from. I understand the discipline he was trying to set when I was nine now, instead of just being like this guy that doesn't want to spend time with his son. So, Okay, so that leads me to my next question, right? So from nine, you know, until about 18, so nine years in between that, that's a pivotal point for teenagers in general, especially mm -hmm. young men, because they're becoming from a boy to a man. Mm -hmm. Would you say you lack that guidance or where did that guidance come from? Well, I will give some, I'll give a lot of credit to my uncle, Uncle Norman. Um, um, <laughs> I feel like everyone has an Uncle Norman. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you're Jamaican, you got an Uncle Norman. <laughs> but um, I give a lot of credit to my uncle because um, when my mom was ill before she passed, she wasn't able to take care of me anymore. So I ended up living with my aunt, Trefina, for a couple of years. Thank, thank you, Auntie Trefina, for <laughs> letting me live with you for a while. And then from then, I started living with my grandmother in the Bronx. Thank you, Grandma, rest in peace. Um, my grandmother, where my uncle was also living there, taking care of his mother, which is my grandmother. And then he just started, he grabbed the bulls by the horns and started raising me. And then I also want to give a very special shout out to Trevor. I have a cousin named Trevor. Some people know him as Sparks, Trevor Sparks, whatever you call him. But when I was in the streets, just without a head, <laughs> he grabbed me and said, All right, you know what? And he used to hang out with my brother. Oh, so wow. he, he, he grabbed me and was like, all right, how about you come with me? and wash cars. He had a car detailing business at the time. So why do you think young men turn to the streets for guidance, if you will? Like there are community centers and like, you know, activities for them to join, but why do you think it is that like the street life is more glamorized to them? Um, growing up, I, I think, well, one, you didn't have technology like how we do now. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I could go on Instagram or Twitter and see. But what, what about is, like community centers? Were those not around back then? What do you mean? Like the Dole Center? Like the Boys and Girls Club. So even like the Boys and Girls Club, back then it used to seem like if you were trying to play basketball for your life or if you were trying to do that, then yeah. But for the most part, you come outside. Well, I'll, I'll tone it back. This is, remember, I'm from 33rd. You're so, from 3rd and 3rd. 3rd and 3rd. 3rd East 4th Street, around the corner from 3rd and 3rd. So I say I'm from 3rd and 3rd. The moment you- But for, want, the, for the people who don't know what 3rd and 3rd is, can you just explain in depth or in layman terms, if you will, what's so special about 3rd and 3rd? Oh, like, it's why, not special. Why are you highlighting that? Like, what anyone, do you want people to know? For anyone that lives in Mount Vernon, you know what 3rd and 3rd is. For the people that don't, Third and third is the most dangerous, broken down, violence, poverty, you name it, in Mount Vernon. Now, they have another block or other blocks that's in Mount Vernon where it's not as safe, but third and third is the most dangerous, horrific block you could think of. And the moment you step outside, violence, drugs, anything that you want and want a child to be around, it's all going on on 3rd and 3rd. So it's hard to make it to the Boys and Girls Club walking through 3rd and 3rd. You'll get caught by that before you make it to the Boys and Girls Club, the Dole Center. I remember one time, well, I won't get, well, I remember one time I went to the Dole Center to um, learn boxing. I was fighting all my life. So I'm like, you know what? I would hear some older cousins like, 
why don't you go boxing? The day I go to Doe Center to go boxing, they just shut down the boxing program. Ah. Uh, so, yeah. That's unfortunate. Yeah, but growing up on that side of town, that was the cool thing to do. And then that's the other thing, like what's cool? Yeah. The music, the, the, the influence, like you, you could go to the park to do flips next minute you're fighting. You could go to the corner store to get a bag of chips. You see your friend, oh, we're about to go rob the, 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 the homeless man. And at that point, you don't really know what's right and wrong. It's just what's fun. Robbing the homeless man. Okay. I have some dark secrets. Okay. <laughs> we don't have to. We don't have to talk about this on camera, but I, I get the gist and I'm sure the audience gets the gist as well. Um, okay. So you're a firefighter now. Yeah. For the Mount Vernon Fire Department. Yes. How did you make that pivot from being, you know, in the streets to serving your community? It's actually by luck. By luck. By, all right. So um, I'm in college. So no hard work, just luck. I want to say no hard work. It's just it wasn't being applied towards the fire service. Okay. But then, so I'll go through with the story. So I'm in college. I was going to WCC at the time and ended up messing up in school. How? I'm in English. Oh, I forgot what, what they called it at the time, but English. Um, and we had an essay. We had an essay. Long story short, they said I plagiarized. <gasps> but did you I did, not cite? I, you didn't I cite did everything. Family? Basically, what the professor was saying is that she know I didn't write it. So when you know, I think back in, back in those days, you could put it through um, some type of program, and they could show you if you plagiarized or not. And all you have to do is cite, like, oh, I got this from here, this. From. So I did everything right, but she was just like, you didn't write this. And then she had her team of people that backed it up. So it was just like, I got an F for this final that I had to turn in. So I dropped my GPA and I wasn't like a A student growing up. So it dropped my GPA and then I couldn't go to school anymore because I was on financial aid. Mm -hmm. So then I have a sister charm that's an accountant and she just started sending me all these government jobs. And at the time the fire department was hiring. So when I seen the fire department was hiring, I did the application just so she wouldn't send it to me. Mm -hmm. That That is it. She's sending me all these applications and I was like, ah, let me just grab the fire department so she don't send it to me. Yeah. And the rest was history. So I, there was never a time I was like, hey, I can't wait to grow up and be a hero. It was just, <laughs> let me just do these applications so she could leave me alone. Okay. And you've been on the force for how long? Seven completed, but I'm in my eighth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you're almost at 10 years. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. I want to go back to your first ever fire. And I want to talk about, I want you to walk me through what that was like. Mm -hmm. Feelings, what you felt going up into it as you suited up and went into this big red truck. What was that like? My first fire, um, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember the address, but it was okay. on 2nd. If you're from Mount Vernon, you know the Mount Vernon Library. It's right across the street. Mm -hmm. um, it was on the first floor. It was a um, Collier's Mansion. And for people that don't know what a Collier's Mansion is, it's basically a hoarder, like someone that hoarders. Oh, okay. And for the fire service, that's... Your worst nightmare. One of them. Yeah. Because now we don't know what we have to fight through. Then that's a more fuel for the fire. So I remember we suit up. We go in, it's me, Valentine, and Jean Jerome. I don't remember who our MPO was. And from the moment you open the door, close your eyes. That's what it's like fighting a fire. You can't see anything. You don't see a single thing. And the thing is, the smoke banks down. So if you want to see, you got to get on the ground. And then you can see, like, the fall plan. So... At that point, I'm like, oh, sh like I'm sure in training, like they tell you what it's like, but you didn't really know See, what the to thing expect. Is in training is that the smoke is white. In a real fire, the smoke is black, pitch black. 
So you're literally looking for a glow. So, and then on top of that, you watch movies, you see how they run in, they got the fire holes, they could see the whole house, there's a fire right there, there's a... No, it's pitch black and you're looking for a glow. So, and I'm ignorant to this because I'm not a firefighter, <laughs> but I just have to ask, you know, the people who go in with the hose, why don't you guys just enter every house like that? Just already like spraying water. You can't just go spraying water. Now there's tactics where you, they call it penciling, where you could spray, close the door, let the steam, and you could cool down it. But the main reason is you climb in and then you want to find the fire. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for this glow. And then normally you have the truck team, because there's a whole system that people don't understand where the truck team will go in because they're the company that's going to look for victims in case there's victims or anything like that. And usually they're the ones that find the fire and then the engine crew just comes right in. It's like, oh, it's right here to the left because they're looking for victims. You're going to have to briefly explain in layman's terms truck difference between truck team and whatever else okay. you said because the engine team and the truck team like i thought everyone that gets on this this truck is the same but clearly not so everyone calls it trucks they're not trucks this is a truck this is a rig <laughs> oh okay this is a rig and this is called an engine so right? this is not a fire truck it, just stop saying stop saying truck okay this is a rig and when when you see this big, well, it's hard to, the, the rigs are newer now, but this is an engine. And with an engine, this is the one that carries the water. This is like a big gallons and gallon water tank, okay. basically, right? So when you see the holes and everything, that's coming from here. Trucks, that's the other one behind this one, that is like a big toolbox. So they look different. Completely. You can tell the difference. And then usually you'll tell the difference because you'll see a ladder. So when you see that big boom turning and touching it, that's the truck. Mm. So just think of a truck as like a big toolbox with a ladder. It has all the tools to cut, dice, break down, you name it. And then the engine has the water. Okay, so just so I understand correctly, the rig goes first. And then the Both of them are called rigs, but this is the engine and that's the truck. Okay, so what comes first, the engine or the truck? Like, who's going to go in first, basically, to fight the fire? See, when you say fight the fire, like, I mean, we're all fighting all the fire. Fight the fire but so they're rescuing. Rescuing or, the people. Yes. But yeah. not, not busy putting the fire out, because that's what somebody else is but doing. But they can help locate the fire. But they don't have the water. They don't have the water. Okay, that's so why on the truck is mainly for more experienced firefighters. Okay, so that first fire, was it successful in terms of saving people or? No fire is a successful fire because someone's losing something. Yeah. This, me becoming a fire, fire, there's a deeper, I could get into that too where how it literally happened. Cause I used to rap before I was a fire. Oh, we're gonna talk about that. Oh, okay. That actually leads me to my next point. <laughs> So you had a lot going on. You were into quite a few things. You did modeling, you did rapping. Mm. How did you get started with those? And then how does it correlate to what you're about to say? Okay. Um, with rapping, I would say it goes back to third grade. So I was going to Edward Williams and we, there was a time it was me, Ricardo, um, Kevin. Your friends? Friends, yes. So, but they, they're, they're right here. But um, there was a time we used to always show up to school with a bar. So I would walk in like, oh, I just left school and I went home and jumped in the pool. And they'd be like, oh. And then it'll be Kevin. He'll he'll have his one bar. Ricardo will have his one bar. Everybody will have their one bar. And every day you just kept coming to with your one bar. And then that grew and grew. And then by middle school, I remember battle rap used to start taking off. And then you had like guys like these dollars. And if you went to battle rap, you know some of these names. Started writing little six teams. Everybody started freestyling. Then I remember there was times we would be in front of McDonald's and everybody's just battling each other. Like, oh, but you had to be freestyling. 
So that's it had that, to come off the dome. So it started teaching me how to be like quick on my feet, and then it just became famous. And then from there, what happened? Then that's when I started hanging out. So most of my life, I was hanging out on the south side, right? So Mount I, Vernon. Mount Vernon, and then. Me and my friend Tehran at the time got tired of fighting. Because literally, on this side of the town, you're fighting every day. Wow. You go to 4th Street, you play ball, that's turning into a fight. So we went over to the north side. Because you didn't want to fight anymore. Yeah, so if anybody knows, 4th Street Park was the tough park. It was, it was a hard park. Hartley Park was a place where kids play a normal park. So it was two complete degrees. You wanted to play ball and get some shots up, go to Hartley. If you wanted to be with the street dudes, roll dice and X, Y, and Z, for Street Park. So then when we finally went over to the north side of the Mount Vernon, that's when I met my friend Tracy. Started hanging out with them. And these dudes at the time was calling themselves Best Your Bet. What? B-Y-B, but it stand for Best Your Bet. I'll never forget that. Best Your Bet. Bet, B-Y-B is yes. the acronym. Yes. Right. So at the time, they had already been like making little songs. And these dudes would just be at his crib every day, just recording over beats, making songs. Just for fun. Just This is the whole like the beginning of the YouTube era. Mm. Back when like Soldier Boy and you watching Kimbo Slice and stuff like that. So I get with the, I start hanging out with these dudes. And they had a party one time over by Graham School. I forgot the block. And I remember me and Teron's in there. Regular basement party. And their song came on. And the whole basement was singing their song. They were hot shit. And I'm like, yo, like half the high school know this dude's song. So from then when I'm hanging out with them and I'll always see them recording, recording, recording. Then eventually I just started getting into the play of things. But you already been rapping since third grade. Yes, but I never like made a song. You you just had the bar for bar thing. Yeah, we was just rapping on there. I remember like shout out to Glory D. I remember Glory D used to walk around with a camera just catching people rap. Mm. So I have a couple videos with man from the video T Mac with there's like twenty thousand views on it, but it's just a bunch of us freestyling. Mm -hmm hanging out with Tracy and them, then that's when it got into like making little songs and albums on SoundCloud. Wow. And that started to take place. And then when that whole thing, like everybody wanted to go solo and everybody wanted to do their own thing. So they won't be a group anymore. Yeah. Over time, things just changed. Uh. So I'll say, go back to remember when I was saying that I messed up in school and started applying for the fire department. I ended up Graduate in WC. I ended up getting my grades back. Oh, congrats. Turning into a straight A student. Okay. Right? Graduate from WCC. I only pro I only um applied to Baruch. Right. I remember even my guys for your bachelor's. Yes. My guys counsel like, yo, you're not gonna make Baruch. Oh. Like he's telling me you can go to one of these CUNY soon as you're not making Baruch. That's and, such a not nice thing to say to a, a thriving student. Well, I wasn't always a thriving student. Yeah, but people can change. So to to, to to even it out is the fact that he knew me as a, a, a student. Mm -hmm. So he's like, you need a, a certain GPA. You fall way below here. Mm -hmm. Apply to some different schools. I only applied to Baruch and got in. Okay, very yeah, good. It's crazy. So now I'm at Baruch and now I'm going to school for finance. And I remember there's a time I'm taking calculus. And at this point, I'm like, yo, <laughs> I'm learning it. I'm going, but calculus was definitely a class where it's like, yeah. I don't really understand it. She's sitting there. She gave us a speech. Your professor. So she, my professor gave us a speech saying how um, if we took the time, applied our 10,000 hours and this, that, and third, we'll be successful. But she was applying that to calculus. In my head in the class, I'm like. You applied it to your life. Yeah, I'm like. Yeah. If I apply all this time to do stuff I don't like and be successful, and at this time I'm a straight A student, I'm like, I really like rapping. I might as well apply all of this energy here. So I dropped out of group. To be a rapper? And started rapping. And my whole family lost it. Like, oh, what are you doing? 
this and that until I Probably ended up. So. <laughs> and then I really started rapping. I went hard with it. And then everybody bought in once I dropped the song Henny Straight. That ended up transforming into me going to London to perform with Connie Diamond because she had a show out there and it was a whole hour set. And she hit me up like, yo, you trying to go to London with me? And I'm like, bet. Like, so now I'm in London. Everybody in, that I know is like, yo, this dude is in London? And then like at the time, everybody used to get like these little $300, $400 videos stand in front of a block and just drink or smoke. And me, I'm shooting full blown videos. I'm hopping in the cars. I got ice cream trucks. I got... So everybody believed in the dream after that point. A whole production. And then I stopped rapping once I found out I had my daughter on the way. Okay. So you're a father to Carmen. Mm -hmm. Pretend it's you had her in 2016? 17. 2017. Pretend it's 2017 again. How did you feel when you found out that you were becoming a father to a baby girl? Ooh. Uh, ooh um... At first, I was kind of down because at that time, I was like, yo, I'm about to pop. You were about to be a rapper. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to pop. Like, this whole thing is spinning. But then what really hit me is that I never had my dad. Mm. I never, I, and to an extent, I never had my mom either. Like, I only had my mom up till about 17. 14. Mm. Oh. No, no, she died when I was 17. But she was getting sick from yeah, 14. So my okay. mom died from a broken heart. Once my brother died, Aww. they say cancer, but I've seen my mom. She died from a broken heart with my brother. So from that point, now fast forward, knowing that I'm about to have a kid, it was just like, all right, I see how my life transpired not having a mother and somewhat not, well, not having a father and somewhat not having a mother. Mm -hmm. So once I knew that this kid is coming to life, it was like, all right, what do I need to do to make sure she's straight and how can I be in her life most effectively? And that's when the fire department popped up. Mm. So everything happens for a reason. So you had your baby girl and then you became, you joined the Mount Vernon Fire Department? Can I, can I just add a little something in? Go ahead. So the funny thing is when the fire department wanted me, right? Yeah. You get a mail, you get mailed and they tell you where you ranked. One being the highest, and then to whatever number they have, they make a list. All right. I'm home, I get the mail, I open it up. I don't remember all the writing, but I remember there's a number seven on it. Rank seven. That's like a lucky number. I didn't even think about it too much. Okay. I put the mail down I'm on my laptop. I go on Facebook. Everybody else got they, they mail. So I see People like, oh, I just got my mail. I'm number 106. And I'm seeing likes and comments and shit. The whole nine yards. Then I'll see another dude. Oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> 52. And I'm sitting. People are going wild. Like, oh, my God, that's great. That's down the third. Then I'm like, oh, I picked up this thing. I'm like, oh, I'm number seven. Put it right back down. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm rapping. At this time, I already dropped out of school because mm -hmm. the thing is, there's a whole waiting period when you apply. It's not like, oh, you apply to the fire department by tomorrow, you're getting an interview. No, you apply. There's probably like a year wait. Mm -hmm. Then there's the written test. It's probably like another four or five months wait. Then there's the, the agility test. Then they got to grade that. Then they make the list and then they start pulling from the list. So I think it's probably like a month or a couple of weeks I'm about to go to London. My brother-in-law is home. When you get when you're on the first batch to get hired at the high the high top of the yes. list. So let's say there's a list of 200 people. Mm -hmm. And let's say they're hiring five people, right? That very first batch, the chief comes to your house. Everybody else will get letters. But the first batch... So they don't even call. He physically comes? He physically comes to your house. Wow, that that's like... That's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So the chief very comes... Very personable. Hey, 
The chief comes to your house and offers you the job. My brother-in-law opens the door. So I get a call now like, hey, yo, the chief is at your house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like, head home. Yeah. They offer you the job. I'm sitting there. Tell them they could keep it. <laughs> I swear to God. Tell them, I didn't know I had a baby on the way. Ah. Uh, I'm that, rapping. Yeah, that changes everything. I got London going on. Mm -hmm. Tell the fire Cause department. Because you, you felt like it was going to go somewhere. Tell the fire department yeah. they could keep it. Wow. They never seen my face. Never seen my face. So, this is how I know God is real. So now. It is. <laughs> now, I go to London. Find out I'm having a kid. Come back. I get another mail. Hey, we would like to have an interview with you. The fire department. Somehow, some way, they forgot I turned down the job. So now, oh. I go in for the interview, and the chief goes, I could have sworn we came to your house. And I'm sitting there like, I never seen you. Because was, you weren't there. I wasn't there. So I'm like, <sighs> I never seen you a day in my life. Mm hmm and, they, and they, they, you could tell they was like, we remember something about this. And then it's just like, all right. And then <laughs> I still was a great candidate to yeah. be hired. But yeah. So one, I was hired in the second group, but I was really supposed to be hired in the first. Wow. Luck. God. True. <laughs> True. Okay. So you know the importance of having a father in your life and you know being the father that you are to your baby girl what is some advice that you can give to first-time fathers something that you wish you knew back then that you know now advice i'll definitely give more advice of how to help the mom mm. because i feel like there's so many for lack of better terms, techniques that everybody feels like, oh, when you're a man, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do it. Honestly, it's just between right here. Mm -hmm. We going to figure this out. What do you need? What do you want? How can I help? I feel like. So gender roles aren't really a thing for you. <laughs> to an extent. Okay. To an extent. Now, granted, like I said, each house, each couple, each situation is different. For me, I would say. For any man that's really about to become a father, pay attention to that woman way more. Mm -hmm. So me, for instance, like, as a man, you're supposed to make the money and, and bring home the baby, pay the bills, this, that. When really she's home hoping she could get a break. Yeah. You, you could pay every bill in the house. You can make sure food is available to be cooked. I mean, everything's taken care of, but what if... She just needs some air. Mm -hmm. And I remember in my early days of being a father, it's like, yo, all you got to do is deal with the baby. I'm, I'm dealing with the world. You get what I'm saying? What do you need a break for? Like, I don't get no break. Mm -hmm. So I would say for any first time father, pay more attention to the woman of how you can help. And then hopefully the woman that you're dealing with to pay more attention to you as well mm -hmm. of how she can help. It's a partnership. Exactly. So breaking the gender norms, right? Is there anything that you do that a woman would probably do back in the day? I mean, things are obviously different in Not today's society. You do everything. I, I cook, I clean, I provide. You name it. I done helped with her hair, <laughs> color, nail, you name it. But, um, <laughs> I, I get that from my mom, though. My mom was very involved with me. Like, mm -hmm. if I was dancing, she was dancing with me. Mm -hmm. If I was singing, she was singing with me. If I was a ninja, she was the teacher to the ninja. Like, we had a bond. People used to call me her, her, um, her, her friends used to call me handbag. Like, oh, you're just, you're just her, her little handbag. They used to call you're always me around. Her. Like, if she, my mom wanted to go try new food, I was with her. Yeah. So it just kind of correlates with me. My mom's like, if I'm doing this, you're doing it with me. If you want to, I just do everything with her. I just do everything with her. And then I guess there's the Jamaican background, how Jamaican men always know how to cook or yeah. clean. And so who knows? I wasn't born in Jamaica. My whole family's Jamaican, but I do everything. I feel like going into the future, everybody should do everything and everybody should help one another. This whole 
you do this, I'll do that. This is going to come complicated. What if you're dating a girl that can't cook? Mm-hmm. Are you going to teach her to cook? Them girls is out there. Are you going to teach her to cook? Or are you just going to leave her alone? <laughs> what if you're dating a guy that got no money? Are you going to help him get on his feet or are you just going to leave him? Everybody wants this perfect person. In 2021, you were awarded a Class 2 citation for rescuing a civilian trapped in a car during a hurricane Ida. Take me back to that moment. What was that like? Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm home with my daughter, <laughs> playing around. I get the call. Can I come into work for mm-hmm. overtime? I say yes. The hurricane started. Coal started going up, places started flooding. It was ridiculous. Like we were, I was, we were knee deep in water. Seriously, in my bunkers. I remember we had a call over by the Salvation Army. It was, it was madness. It was madness. The mayor was out there. The chief, the chief of the department was out there. It was crazy. So we get a call by Target. Um, Sanford Boulevard, Mm -hmm. saying that a car is pinned. Most people don't realize that. I think that's the Hutchison that runs that way. But it looks like a road, but it's actually a bridge. And then there's the river right before and after. Mm -hmm. You had people still out there driving. And there was enough water, but you could see over the water. But people thought they could drive through the water. This guy, he's tried to drive through and, and uh, the waves just pin him to the, to, the, to the other side of the bridge. And he has his windows up, thank God. Mm-hmm. But if he winds down his window too much, All the, water's the water will just flow right in. Mm-hmm. So most people don't know the fire department has a boat. Mm. So <laughs> I'm on the rescue. We come back to the firehouse. We pick up the boat. At this time, this is my first time ever getting this boat. I've seen this boat at the firehouse a thousand times. I I used to think it was a prop after a while. Like, yeah, yeah, we we train on it, this, that, and the third, but we're never going to use that. (laughs) Today, we have to use it. So when we bring in this boat, I'm like, we really picked up a boat? We go. We detach the boat. We descend it. And we're really, at first, we try to use the paddles. We're on the boat trying to paddle to this guy, right? It's not but, electric? No. This is, this is oh, your, it's a paddle boat? Yes. Oh. Well, <laughs> but then on top of that, the, the current is so strong. Yeah. Like, the motor's not even built for that. So, we start just drifting with our little paddles. So, then we have to go get... A pipe pole. I could get a pipe pole to show you what a pipe pole is, but we had to get a pipe pole because the pipe pole is long enough where we can anchor it into the ground and push. Mm -hmm. So we had to sit there with pipe poles, not the paddles, and like catch an anchor, push, push, get to him. Then we had had him um, lower his window because at the time the wave wasn't at the window as Mm -hmm. much. And then he had to crawl out, get his belongings, and then we had to pull, pull back over to where land was. Because mm-hmm. if he had got out, if he had let the, the water get into the car, drowned. People can't swim through that type of stuff, And right? no, he could not swim through that. So he would have went Just right upstream. Just drifted right with them. So. Um, okay, so here also, what was it like getting that, that award? Funny thing is, I didn't even know I was getting an award. Of course not. <laughs> One day, I'm driving... The commissioner, Norman, calls me and says, hey, we need you down by station two. So I'm like, okay. We're doing an award ceremony and um, be dressed. I didn't have time to go. So we have multiple uniforms. Mm-hmm. We have this. We have that one. Is this one. considered dressed? No, this is our work uniform. Okay. Right. Then we have our firefighting uniform, mm-hmm. and then we have our class A's. That's like when you see us with the suit, the bell cap. Okay. Those are like special occasions, but mine was in the cleaners. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have time to go get it from the cleaners and attend this award ceremony. What did you show up in? I showed up in my work uniform. Okay. And they have this whole backdrop. They got the podium there, the whole nine yards. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. because Surprise, at this, surprise. At this point... <laughs> 
<laughs> we haven't done this on the job. Yeah. For, at the time when I was there, I think I was like five years on the job or six years at the job at the time. We haven't done this. And then they was like, oh, you're getting a, um, an award. So I'm like, what, what kind of award is this? And he was like, oh, you, you're supposed to get a class two. Um, it's a really good award. That, that's how people are saying it to me at first. I didn't know that there's levels mm. to awards. So, and to be honest, I don't, I still don't know all of them, but mm. you could get like a, um, an EMS award. You could get, they even have awards for like um, people that work during 2020. You'll get oh, a um, pandemic award. Mm. But then there's a class, a, I mean, class one in a class two. Those are the top two. Mm -hmm. Class two, if I'm not mistaken, is if you make a, sorry, if you make a save, but it's not related to fire. Mm -hmm. Class one is if you made a fire save, okay. like you save someone from a fire. So I got a class two, but that doesn't happen very often. So like even like yeah it doesn't happen very often. Well, congratulations. Um, thank you. I'm thank sure you. you were happy walking into that ceremony. Yes, it was. It was definitely. I, th the funny thing is with me is that every time I win something or do something, I keep going back to the mind like I never would imagine being a firefighter. Yeah. So the fact that all of this is coming along with it, even to sit here in this interview with a with an engine behind me, being oh how's it like to be a some would call a hood hero. It's like, I never knew all of this was going to happen. Yeah. Seriously. Well, that's amazing. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Well deserved. Um, so with my series, as many people who watch, you know, um, the goal is to always uplift as you climb. Right. Mm -hmm. So you gave advice to the young fathers. But what about the young men who aren't fathers yet? but are wanting to move up in the community and just make something out of themselves. What is something that you could share with them advice wise that could get them keep, to keep going? I would say change your surroundings. Or be mindful of your surroundings. Be very mindful of your surroundings because there is so much information out there there's so many better perspectives out there that can all you that a little sentence or word can really change your whole reality. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like your life is being stagnant, if you feel like you're doing the same thing over and over, if you feel like things aren't working, one, start with you, and then two, start with your surroundings. What information are you listening to? What things are you getting involved in? The people that you're dealing with, because the moment you move from this circle and go to this circle, they might be talking about sex, money, and drugs. These people are talking about investments, fishing, family, holidays, traveling. And now it's like, oh my God, I didn't know any of this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, because you want to change your surroundings. And then even when you get into this surrounding, after a while, you have to change that one too. So what I'm hearing from you is change is okay and to embrace it. Change is always the way to go. If, you're, if change isn't happening, you're too comfortable. Hmm. You're never supposed to be comfortable in life, ever. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, Firefighter Colby, you said a lot. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>